Hi, my name's Brian. I'm the lead pastor here at Frontline. And I just want to thank you for joining our services online today. It's our hope that through these messages, the Word of God works powerfully in you and that you're built up in your faith and your relationship with Jesus. Well, what I want to do is I want to remind you that our vision here at Frontline is for every person to be plugged into a community of faith that preaches the Word of God. So our goal for these online messages is not that this would be a replacement for a community, but rather a supplement to your faith walk. So we strongly encourage everyone to enter into a physical community where they can be known and use their talents, join in worship, and work with others to proclaim the gospel. Our vision is that this would give you the opportunity to not miss a week where, for example, you're sick or maybe you happen to be gone traveling. So if you'd like more information on where or when we hold our services, then a great way to take a next step with that is you can find all that information at FrontlineGR.com. And one more time, I just want to thank you for joining us, and we really hope that God speaks to you powerfully in the message today. Amen. Well, good morning, everybody. It's great to see you. Great to have you with us. Um, I would like to follow up on the heels of that and just celebrate something together if we could uh, as a church. So I want to invite to the stage Jesse, our missional pastor, and a couple of guys uh, that were on the Haiti trip recently uh, that, was, that went last week. And in case you didn't know, uh, we had four men from Frontline Church and also four men from Center Church, which is our uh, campus in Byron Center that's part of us. And they went with our missions partner, Ebenezer, to Haiti. And they got to spend some time in Haiti seeing the, the, the missions partner and seeing the work that's being done there. And uh, so, Jesse, can you just share with us a little bit about what the purpose of the trip was and what you guys got to experience? Yeah, absolutely. So it was, it was an awesome trip, had an awesome group of guys Obviously, they're not all here. These are the ones that we decided to take back with us. We left the rest over there. So, <laughs> no, just kidding. <laughs> but um, yeah, it was, it was just a, a really awesome time. And I, and I hesitate, you know, you think about these trips that we go on, you think of missions trips, and sometimes you think about, you know, we're going over there and we're going to go do something. That's always the question that's like, what are you going to go do over there? What are you going to go build over there? You're like, who are you going to mm -hmm. yeah. take care of and everything? And that really was not the purpose of this trip. 
um, really the, what was at the core of it was discipleship. Mm -hmm. It was, you know, de seeing discipleship at work in the country of Haiti um, through, our, through our partner organization and then just in what he's doing in us. So we went over there and we got to, you know, experience the culture. We got to experience and, and just see firsthand, you know, the effects of, of poverty in, in one of the poorest countries in the entire world. Um, and, and just the, the church's response to that. Um, the church's response to the poverty, to different religions, to voodoo, to all of these things, and just kind of what they're doing. And so got to see this new expression of church, just this really dynamic uh, group of people who are so excited and so passionate about, about mm -hmm. Jesus. And so they have these church, we attended a couple church services, one that was like, like three hours long, so in a language we didn't understand. So that was super fun. So we're going to do that today. Um, here, no, just kidding. <laughs> no? No, Okay. Anyway, it was, yeah, it was an awesome time, um, just, and just really got to pour into each other, get to, got to know each other, more about each other, and um, encourage each other and the people that were there. Um, you know, and it's all for the purpose, you know, not to go over there and do something and help them. They, they are doing it, you know, doing an awesome job raising up disciples and missionaries there. But we came as encouragers, but really we just came back and, and, and looking forward to the mission that God has for for us here in the United States, here in Grand Rapids, and, um, and just using that experience to pour into that. So that's kind of what the trip was about. Awesome. Well, I just want to thank you guys for going and, and representing Frontline and, and uh, getting to experience that. And something we've changed around a little bit, we used to pray for teams before they would leave and go on a mission trip like this. But now we've switched it around to where uh, when they come back, we actually pray for them and uh, do a prayer of commissioning for them as they return. Because these guys have experienced something. They've seen something they have new eyes to see with, new ears to hear with, and they're seeing the kingdom of God in a different way. Um, and so they're going to have to integrate that experience into their daily lives as they go back to work, as they go back to their families, their neighborhoods, their friendships, and be able to share, uh, you know, what their experiences were. So uh, one, I'd love the chance to pray and commission them as they return. But also, I just want to mention, find these guys and ask them about their experience. Ask them about what they learned. Ask them about uh, what uh, impacted them the most on the trip. Part of the value of this is the way that God shapes and forms us as we see the church expressed globally. So it's a powerful thing. So would you extend your hand uh, this way, just symbolically? We're going to say a prayer over them. Lord Jesus, I just thank you for these men and for the guys who went at center uh, and who just went and experienced Ebenezer, God. And we just pray right now, um, Lord, that you would just give them language to be able to talk about what they experienced God, would you continue to shape and form them and give them a way to understand what it was that they experienced? And we thank you for your church that's global, that's universal, that is around the world worshiping in the name of Jesus. We thank you for the power that is in the name of Jesus to transform lives for all of eternity in every culture, every tribe and tongue. And we just pray, God, that you would just allow us to experience that more fully, whether it be here in America, whether it be overseas, um, God, to be to partner together to be your church. We love you. Would you be with these men as they uh, enter back into life? And um, God, would you just allow us to see through their eyes? And we just ask this in Jesus' name, and everyone would say, amen. All right, thank you guys. Can we give them a hand uh, just for thank, coming? And thank you guys. Awesome. Awesome. Well, we are today in week number four of a series that we've been calling Unexpected. And essentially what we've been doing is we've been looking at different miracles of Jesus that you find in the gospel stories. And what we've been discovering is with each one of these miracle stories, they're never just like an event in and of themselves. Like just kind of this isolated event story that you read. With each one of these miracle stories, there is a message underneath that points to the true identity and the true mission of who Jesus really is. And with each one of these miracle stories, there's kind of an invitation for each one of us to experience Jesus at a new level, to understand him at a deeper level and what he came here to do. And so each week we've looked at a different miracle story and today we're gonna do that again. I wanna begin with a quote if I could this morning. And the quote is from G.K. Chesterton. He's a Christian author. He said this, if a thing is worth doing, it is worth doing badly. That's counterintuitive to the way we think, isn't it? We would say if, if, if a thing is worth doing, well, then it's worth doing expertly. It's worth doing to the best of our ability. If a thing is worth doing, we should do it professionally, right? And there are areas of life where that's absolutely true. We want the professional. If you're going to have open heart surgery, 
You do not want the 22-year-old guy who's like, yeah, you know, I'm right out of college. I helped participate in a few of these, but I've never really cracked someone's chest open before. But don't worry, we get in there, we're going to figure it all out together. You don't want that guy, right, operating on you. You want the chief of surgery. You want the guy who's an expert, a professional who's done hundreds of these open heart surgeries. That's the guy you want operating on you. But what G.K. Chesterton argues in his book, What's Wrong with the World, is he says that actually the most meaningful experiences in life, the most worthwhile activities, are actually best done by amateurs. They're they're actually best done by people who don't have all this expertise and knowledge and professionalism, and that's in fact what makes it meaningful. So if a thing is worth doing, it's actually worth doing badly. Uh, this is kind of an interesting Sunday for me. You heard Blake just mention that we're at the end of our fiscal year as a church, which means nothing to most of you. Uh, But for me, this is kind of a weird anniversary too. This Sunday, the third Sunday here in May is actually, um, today is the 12-year anniversary since I became the lead pastor of Frontline. So this is kind of an interesting morning for me. Um, I had been on staff before, but this is 12 years today. And so I've been reflecting and looking back uh, this week over not just this past year, but over the last 12 years. And if I can be honest with you, something I've struggled with over 12 years being your pastor is how do we effectively and efficiently disciple people? How do we do that? Especially as the church has grown over the years, like how do we, what's the best way, the most efficient way to disciple people? And we've tried all kinds of things as a church. We've tried formal classes Uh, you know, with books and resources and curriculum taught by professional theologians and experts. We've tried self-directed studies. We've tried all church campaigns, you know, where everybody's reading the same thing at the same time and we're all, and we're talking about it, you know, on Sundays and everything. And those, those have been great. And we've seen some really good things happen with that. But but I would say in 12 years, I have yet to find like a one-size-fits-all perfect professional way to disciple every person. I just, I haven't found it yet. And what I'm coming to believe, what I'm starting to to just believe is true is maybe discipling people is one of those things that's best done by amateurs, non-professionals in in a one-on-one kind of way. Is that actually the best way for discipling to happen? I actually think Jesus thought that. In fact, what we're going to look at this morning, we're going to go to Luke chapter 5. And the story that we're looking at this morning is widely called the calling of the first disciples. That's the way it's described. So this is the moment where Jesus calls his very first disciples. And what I want you to take notice of is when Jesus calls his first disciples, he calls a bunch of amateurs. He doesn't go around and find like the professional rabbis and and says, you know, okay, I'm going to need somebody who really knows what they're doing. Uh, you know, to, to, for this job. He doesn't do that. He goes and finds people who <laughs> very, very specifically would not have had everything figured out and would not have been professional teachers and theologians. And that's who he calls. Some things are best done by amateurs. So this is Luke 5, starting in verse 1. Here's how the story begins. One day, as Jesus was preaching on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, great crowds pressed in on him to listen to the word of God. He noticed two empty boats at the water's edge, for the fishermen had left them and were, and were washing their nets. Stepping into one of the boats, Jesus asked Simon, its owner, to push it out into the water. So he sat in the boat and taught the crowds from there. So what's happening in this moment is Jesus is standing on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, and the longer Jesus preaches the word of God, the bigger and bigger and bigger the crowd becomes. By the way, that is the exact opposite of what happens to me. The longer and longer I preach, the smaller the crowd in this room seems to become. But Jesus had something I don't have. And so as he's preaching, more and more and more people are coming. And so it's to the point where nobody can hear. And so he says to this fisherman right there, his name is Simon. He says, hey, I'm going to get in your boat, push the boat back so he can kind of get a little ways out from the shore. And then he can project. And this, this large crowd of people can hear him over the water, especially that would have carried better. And so that's what's happening. Now, just to give you a picture of where these guys are, uh, if you guys could go to that picture, this is an actual picture of the North Shore of Galilee today. 
So this is the general area where Jesus was on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee. Now what you'll see there is there are all these names pointed out of these famous places. Uh, Those are names of places that became famous in the Gospels. So these are sites, if you read the Gospel stories that, that appear, these are the places Jesus traveled around to where he taught people, where he healed people, where he preached the kingdom of God and did miracle after miracle. This is, that's what we're looking at there. So what I want you to see is Jesus in this moment is poised. He's standing right at the precipice of launching into this ministry that not only made history in the gospels and in this time in the first century, but is still making waves in our world today. It's why we're gathered in this room even today is for what Jesus went around in this area and did over the next few years. So this is a huge moment. Jesus is about to call the people, the first disciples who are going to join him to, be able to, to begin to change the world. That's what's happening here. The story goes on from there. It says, when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, now go out where it is deeper and let down your nets to catch some fish. Master, Simon replied, we worked hard all last night and didn't catch a thing. But if you say so, I'll let the nets down again. And this time, their nets were so full of fish, they began to tear. A shout for help brought their partners in the other boat. And soon, both boats were filled with fish and on the verge of sinking. So this is the miraculous moment, right? I mean, Jesus, the professional rabbi, says to Simon, the professional fisherman, I want you to go out into deeper water and I want you to throw your net over. And the miracle is this huge catch of fish that comes in unexpectedly. And so Jesus gives fishing advice to the professional fisherman. And I love what happens here in this moment. Simon responds by saying, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't been able to catch anything. Translation, here's the translation of that. Master theologian, master rabbi, master and a whole lot of other things besides teaching or besides fishing, I mean. We, the professionals, while you were catching some Z's last night, we were out there and we worked hard all night and we didn't manage to catch anything. But now you, the non-professional, just have a feeling that there are some fish out there that just want to snuggle up into a nice net. Do you, do you see what's going on here in this moment? There's a little sarcasm to this. Master, we've been out all night. We haven't managed to catch anything. But then Simon makes this statement. Go ahead. He says, if you say so, I will. But if you say so, I will. And this statement is actually what defines what Jesus is actually looking for from any disciple. He's not looking for our expertise, our professionalism, our skills that we would bring to the table. Jesus is looking for this statement right here. But if you say so, I will obedience. Simon responds with obedience to what Jesus is asking him to do. And and obedience actually takes faith. I'm going to point something out that I'm almost embarrassed to point out because it feels like I'm just kicking a dead horse. Like we just keep saying the same thing. Every single week, you notice this same element appears in almost every one of these miracle stories. What's happening right here is this is a yes before how moment. This is a moment where literally Simon, it's like, this makes no sense. How is this whole miracle going to work? Go out in the water? We've been out loud all last night. But faith is always a move of saying, yes, I will trust you. Yes, I will be obedient. Yes, I will step forward at what you say, even though I don't understand the how. And that's what Jesus is actually looking for in disciples. And this, that's what Simon responds with. He, he responds and says, Uh, because you say so, if you say so, I will. The text goes on from there. It says, when Simon Peter realized what had happened, he fell to his knees before Jesus and said, oh Lord, please leave me. I am such a sinful man. For he was awestruck by the number of fish they had caught, as were the others with him. His partners, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, were also amazed. Now, there's something interesting that's happening right here in this small passage we just read. There's this giant evolutionary step forward in Simon's relationship with Jesus. 
And I, I, to be honest with you, I'd never noticed this before in, in, in this last week, um, looking through this and studying this, but it has to do with the language that's being used. Do you happen to remember when Jesus says to Simon, I want you to go out in the fishing, go out into the deeper water and throw your net over the side of the boat. Do you remember what Simon calls Jesus? Anybody remember? Master, that's right, master. We've worked hard all night and we haven't managed to catch anything. The word master there is the Greek word epistates. And epistates means, it's actually a very generic term. It's very nonspecific and it means any kind of a superintendent. It's like the word boss. So literally in that moment, he's kind of like, okay, boss, if you, but if you say so, I will, boss. He calls him boss. But then what happens is in verse 8, uh, after this giant catch of fish comes in and both boats are loaded down, Simon falls down in front of Jesus and he calls him what? Lord. He calls him Lord. Lord is the Greek word kyrios. And kyrios actually is a very specific word, and it means he to whom I belong. That's what the word Lord means. He to whom a person belongs. It's actually the exact same Greek word that's found in Romans 10 verse 9, which is a verse in the last 12 years. I can't even tell you how many times we've looked at that verse together. And what it says is if we confess Jesus as Lord, Kyrios, with our mouths, and we believe in our hearts that God raised Jesus from the dead, we will be what? Saved. So the way that we receive the gospel, the way that we enter into everlasting life in Jesus is we confess him as Lord. We come to this, this step, this point in our relationship with him where we recognize he's not a, just a boss. He's not just a good teacher. He's not just a guy who had some cool ideas. He is Lord. He is the one to whom I belong. That's what's happening here in this moment. And what's interesting is the gospel writer Luke does something else in the language of the passage. Up to this point in, this, in the story, Simon has been referred to as Simon. Now, later on in the Gospel of Luke, there's going to come a point where his name is changed to Peter. Jesus gives him that name, and he has a new identity that's given to him by Jesus. But what happens here in this moment is in verse 8, in this verse where Simon calls Jesus Lord, Luke refers to him as Simon Peter. So it's the first time he's referred to in that way as Simon Peter. So what's happening is Luke is giving us a hint that in this moment as he confesses Jesus as Lord, there's a new identity that's being gifted to him. That he, there's a new person emerging in this moment. And that's what happens when we begin to walk in a relationship with Jesus, when we begin to experience him as Lord of our lives, we become a new person. We have a new identity that's given us. We, we, it actually says we become a new creation in 2 Corinthians 5. That's what we are in, in Christ. And so that's what's happening in this moment is Peter has become a disciple. And so I, I want to just pause for a second. I feel like this story invites us to ask the question, is Jesus your boss or is Jesus your Lord? As you think about your relationship with Jesus, where are you on that question? Is he your boss or is he your Lord? You say, well, what's the difference? I'm not sure I know the difference. If Jesus is your boss, then you're much more concerned with appearances, making everything look right, than you are with like true repentance at the heart level. It's, it, you're consumed with, if he's your boss, it's, you, it's all about making it look good on the outside, just like you do when the boss is watching, right? But it's not about true repentance of heart. If, if Jesus is your boss and that's all he is, you are a person who is consumed with guilt. And there are tons of people like this in the church, by the way consumed with guilt. Everything, man, I feel so bad about all the ways I messed up this week. I feel so terrible. In fact, some of you are here this morning because this past week you messed up a whole bunch and you did some really bad things that you feel sick about. And so you thought, man, I better get my butt to church on Sunday. That's what I better do. I know that because you tell me these things. That, that, that's, that's the way we think when Jesus is our boss. We're more consumed with guilt than we are with grace. We're not operating out of this gratitude and thankfulness that, man, there's there's nothing for me to prove, nothing for me to gain or for me to lose. I, everything I have, it's been gifted to me in Christ. And so we just get, get to live out of that gratitude. Jesus is your boss only. 
You're, you're consumed with how do I control my life? How do I control the outcomes? How do I make sure I understand how everything is gonna work out for me instead of being consumed with how do I surrender more to Jesus? How do I follow him? How do I say yes before how and just trust him? But what happens is when Jesus becomes your Lord, the word kyrios, Lord, he is the one to whom I belong. What happens is our identity is changed. We see ourselves as being adopted as children of God, as sons and daughters of our heavenly father, not by our own ability, not by our own merit, our own professionalism that we brought to the table, but we are adopted into the family of God by Jesus' sacrifice on the cross and his resurrection that paid the price for us. And we, we begin to realize that our sins are forgiven and that all of our needs are going to be supplied by his riches and glory, not by our effort or our ability. It's this revolutionary transformation that happens that shapes everything else in your life. That's what's happened to Peter in this moment. He's become a, a disciple of Jesus. He's saved. He's following Jesus. And so Jesus has come into his life and he's made him a really successful fisherman. Isn't that great? What an awesome story. Except that's not the end of the story. In actuality, there's, there's quite a bit more. Jesus, in this moment, it isn't just an event where Jesus comes in and saves a guy and then helps him become a more successful fisherman. As much as we would maybe like that, this story actually points to something else. It, it, invites, uh, it invites us to look at ourselves a little bit differently. So here's how the story actually ends. Jesus replied to Simon, don't be afraid. Once again, that is the most repeated command in all of scripture. Do not be afraid. From now on, you'll be fishing for people. And as soon as they landed, they left everything and followed Jesus. They is Simon, Peter, James, and John, the first three disciples. Literally at this moment, Jesus says, from now on, you're gonna be fishing for people. As soon as they get to shore, they pull up their boats, they drop their nets on the shore, their livelihood, everything they'd been making money with and, li and living their lives for, they drop it and they walk away and follow Jesus because they found something better to give their lives to. They found something better to, that they'd been invited into that, that was more important. Now, what's interesting is this phrase, fishing for people. We've, if you've grown up in the church, you've heard that phrase, fishers of men, fishers of, for people. You've heard that phrase before. What's interesting is Jesus actually didn't invent that phrase. He wasn't the first one to use it. In fact, in a Jewish context, that would have been a phrase they were actually familiar with. There's two different places in the Old Testament where that phrase, fishing for people, is used. The, the two passages are Jeremiah 16, 16 and Habakkuk 1, 15. Those are the two passages. And in both of those passages, the phrase fishing for people is used as a uh, metaphor for finding people for judgment for their sin. It's actually a metaphor about fishing for people so they can be punished and brought into judgment for the way they've messed up and sinned. And what Jesus does here in this moment is he takes this familiar metaphor in, in the culture that he was a part of in, in this Old Testament um, environment, and he, he literally takes it and he spins it and he makes it about grace and forgiveness from that judgment. So instead of God fishing for people to judge them for their sin, Jesus is inviting disciples, calling disciples to go fish for people so they can be rescued from that judgment, so they can come into grace, so they can be redeemed and set free. It's, it's this powerful metaphor that Jesus uses here in this moment. And so what's happening in this moment is Jesus is inviting Simon and the other disciples to ask the question, what is beyond me? What is beyond me? And not just for them, but for any of us who would call ourselves disciples of Jesus, at some point we have to ask the question, what is beyond me? In other words, just like Jesus didn't in interact with Simon here and save him in order to make him a more successful fisherman, Jesus doesn't save us so that we can just sit in a chair and receive. Now, it, it, there's, that's part of it. I'm glad you're here this morning. There, there are absolutely, it's, it's part of following Jesus is coming and regularly sitting in the presence of God with other believers and worshiping him and learning from the word of God. That is part of it. But he didn't save us just to sit in a chair and receive for the rest of our lives. At some point, he invites all of us to ask the question, 
what's beyond me? How, how does he want to call me to fish for people? The, the, the term that's been used, maybe some of you maybe have heard of it, is the term spiritual obesity. It's this term that describes the, the church in America today that we're so educated, so far beyond our level of obedience. We see ourselves, we see what it means to follow Jesus as sitting and stuffing our heads with more and more and more and more information that never translates into some sort of actual lived action. We're called to be fishers of people. If you want to learn how to catch fish, you don't go to the pet store. Right? If you, if you want to learn how to keep fish, you go to the pet store. The pet store, they can tell you exactly how to keep fish. They can tell you what kind of aquarium you need, how big it needs to be for the fish you're trying to keep. They can tell you how many gallons of water you need. They can tell you how many, you know, what the pH level of the water needs to be, what kind of food those fish need. They can tell you exactly how to keep fish. But if you're looking to go out and catch fish, that's a totally different skill, isn't it? Here's all I'm saying with that. I wonder if in the church today, we've been called by God to this high calling of fishing for people, but I wonder if we've settled for just being keepers of the aquarium. And I'm talking to myself here right now as a pastor for 12 years. Have I become satisfied with being a keeper of the aquarium and making sure the, the aquarium is just a little bit nicer and the pH levels are right in the water and every, every so it's a perfect environment to keep the fish? Or am I passionate about fishing for people? Let, let me tell you, I would rather be an amateur, mediocre fisher of people than a professional keeper of the aquarium. That's what Jesus has called us to the church is not supposed to just be this place where we, we settle for keeping fish happy. It's supposed to be a place where we come and we get equipped and we get trained and we develop a passion through being in the presence of God together, through worshiping him, for focusing on, through focusing on the person of Jesus. We get passion and we go out and we become fishers of people. We've made this statement before. If you've been to Frontline uh, for a number of years, you've heard me say this before, but I haven't said it, I don't think, in a few years. And so it's this phrase, a disciple who makes disciples is a disciple. At some point, we have to kind of go back and redefine, what does it mean to be a disciple? According to Jesus, a disciple who makes disciples is a disciple. Now, why is that important? It's important because over the years, I can't tell you how many conversations I've had with, with someone, people who will say, man, I'm, I'm coming to this point where Jesus is Lord of my life and praise God for that. But hey, I'm ready to go deeper. I, like, I wanna go deeper in my discipleship. Tell me how I can go deeper. And my response to that is always the same. I always say, that's awesome. It means you're ready to start discipling others. And usually the response I will get is like, oh, no, 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 you, you misunderstood me. I'm ready to go deeper in my discipleship. I'm not looking to disciple anyone else. I want to go deeper in my discipleship. A disciple who makes disciples is a disciple. That's what it means to go deeper in discipleship. Say, that can't be true. Take a look. This is Matthew 28. Again, this is a passage of scripture we've looked at, but not in a while. This is widely known in the church as the Great Commission. It's, it's the... It's actually Jesus after he rose from the grave. These are his final words to his disciples before ascending into heaven. This is widely known as this is the great commission for the church. This is the instructions Jesus gave us for what we're supposed to be about as the church. He says this, Jesus came and told his disciples. So he's talking to his disciples here. I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. That's because of his death on the cross and his resurrection. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, America, Haiti, Ethiopia, all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you and be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. The church is not centered around a personality or a human personality anyway. It's not even centered around uh, some goals or some numbers or some data. The, the church is centered around the person of Jesus. 
And the closer we draw to the person of Jesus and the, and the deeper we go in discipleship with him, the more we should begin to develop a passion for others, for the nations, for discipling others, for fishing for people. That's what the church is supposed to be. Far more than an aquarium for fish, it's meant to be a place where we get equipped and trained and fired up to become fishers of people. That's what we're called to be. Can I talk about Frontline for a moment? Can I, can I just talk about us? Um, as, as we begin to reflect, and it, as I said, you know, this has been a, a time of reflecting on this past year, and it's been an incredible year. I'm so proud of our staff and our volunteers. Uh, we had a volunteer banquet on Tuesday and just got to celebrate and say thank you to people. It's been kind of a week of just saying thank you. And um, man, we've, God has blessed us. We've had an incredible year, not just in salvations and baptisms, but even in the way he's provided for our needs with the roof and the sound system. But, but I got to tell you, God isn't asking us to rest on our laurels now. We're not supposed to just kind of sit back and be comfortable and make the aquarium just, you know, 20% better. It's time for us as a church to take a next step. It's time for us to keep fishing for people, to keep in, taking steps to see that happen. And so um, if I could tell you about something that God has been doing in our midst, several months ago, uh, Brad Vanderson, who is our student ministry pastor, he oversees NowGen, which is our ministry to middle school and high school students. He came to Blake and I uh, several months ago and just said, hey, I'm sensing I'm kind of in my last year as a student ministry pastor. Like, like there's something more I'm supposed to do. There's a next step for me. I'm not really sure what that is, but I just know I'm, I'm kind of nearing this point where I know it's, it's time for me to, uh, to take another step. And just so you know, Brad has been our student ministry pastor for the past four and a half years. And before he did that, before he stepped into that, he sat right where you sat. He was attending Frontline. He was volunteering in the student ministry. He didn't have ministry credentials or any of that. He's developed, you know, he's gone and developed that as he's gone. He stepped in, said yes before how, and God has just been equipping him and raising him up. And so Blake and I both affirmed this. We were like, yeah, we can see that. It is time for you to take a next step. And, uh, but at the same time, we didn't know what that was either. And so Brad didn't want to leave Frontline, and we didn't want Brad to go but we were kind of like, I, we don't know what that means because there's not another job here at Frontline for him to fill. And so we just were kind of wrestling with that and wondering about that. Right about this same period of time, there is another church, uh, another Wesleyan church in Wayland, actually, which is on the south end of town. We already have a, a campus in Byron Center on the south end of town. And this church is called New Life. And this church began to enter into a, a mentoring relationship with us God has just been giving us some really cool opportunities around zero, what it means, uh, the vision of zero. And so uh, we began to enter into this mentoring relationship with this other church around the zeros. And in fact, this month, the month of May, was supposed to be uh, the first month we were going to have three churches preaching through the same sermon series together, which was awesome. I mean, that was the, the first time that would ever have happened was uh, the month of May. We were going to have three churches preaching through the same sermon series together. And so I'm going to make a very long story very short just to say God moved over the last couple months unexpectedly, un unexpected. God moved in, in a way that was so clear to all of us. And what's happening right now is Brad is going to go and he is actually going to go be the next lead pastor of New Life Church in Wayland. And New Life Church in Wayland is actually becoming part of us as a third campus of Frontline. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> We couldn't foresee that happening, but God has clearly done that. The leadership team is agreement. The, our, our denomination is in agreement. We're taking this step. And I got to tell you, I think this is just the beginning of what God wants to do, of, of the way he wants to call us to fish for people. And he wants to do it. Not us, not because we bring some amazing expertise to the table, but because we're willing to say, okay, yes, before how? If you say so, we will. That level of obedience. And what's beautiful is right now, uh, Brad is actually there this morning preaching at New Life. And um, tonight, Brad is going to be with us for Behind the Lines. So I invite you to come and be up, uh, with us 6 p.m. here in the block. And um, we're going to have a time where we're going to be able to pray and commission Brad. And he's going to get a chance to share a little bit about what this experience has meant to him. And what you're going to see is, is uh, God is putting a burden on Brad to fish for people in Wayland. 
He is developing a passion and a burden for the people of Wayland to minister to them. I told him, I said, man, you're going to have to give up all your hipster clothes and you're going to have to dress in camo (laughs) and like hunting gear and stuff, which would just be awesome, hilarious to watch. And he's like, I know, it's fine because he's ready to step into this. God is beginning to prepare his heart and do that. So here's the question some of you might be asking right now in your heads. Uh, And the question is, okay, wait a minute. Is Brad ready for this? I mean, is Brad, like, is he professional enough? I mean, four and a half years ago, he was just sitting in a chair. Is he ready to do this? You know what the answer to that question is, as honestly as I can answer? I have no idea. (laughs) I sure wasn't ready 12 years ago this Sunday when I took over as lead pastor of this church. Amateur is a generous term. But what I believe is that some things are best done by amateurs. Because when we just say, because you say so, I will. And we step forward. What happens is the power of Jesus, which is the power that transforms lives. It's the real power at work in the gospel that gives people new life, that that performs miracles, that, that invites people into eternal life. That power begins to work. And then what happens is he's the one who gets the glory. He's the one who gets the credit. And he's the one who gets all the honor, not us, because we have nothing to brag about. Some things are best done by amateurs. So as the band comes out, Uh, Before we respond this morning, uh, I just want to say, what about you? As you think about you, as you think about your life, where are you in this? As you think about your relationship with Jesus, have you settled the issue? Is is he your boss or is he your Lord? That's the number one thing. It's the number one thing we care about. Our, Our Our vision is that every single person, that there would be zero people living in this place in their life where they haven't come to a point of recognizing who Jesus is, that he is Lord, and and that you're experiencing that new life in him. But then for those of you, maybe you've been saved, you've been following Jesus for a number of years. For you this morning, God didn't just save you just so you could sit. Sure glad you're here. And and I want God to, to, to speak to you and to draw you into his presence every single week as you're here. But the question is, what is beyond me? Is it time for you to ask that question? What is beyond me? Who? Who is Jesus calling me to fish for? Would you just bow with me for a moment? Jesus, the question that stands before us is, what is beyond ourselves? So this morning, God, we're not going to concern ourselves with how. We just trust that you've got the how figured out, that you're going to do your work and your power as we act in obedience to you. And so this morning, God, we say to you, because you say so, we will. We will go. We will be fishers of people. We will open our mouths and speak when you tell us to speak and what you tell us to speak. We will step into places that are risky to love people who have been forgotten and left on the margins. We'll go. And so Jesus, have your way. Do what you want to do because we recognize in this place this morning that everything we see happening right now is a result of your power, that there is power in the name of Jesus to redeem and to reconcile and to give people new life and to call us into a new life in you. And so God, we just ask that you would just continue to do that in greater, greater numbers in our world and in our community. And God, we just thank you that we get to be a part of that, that we get to be your people chosen and sent to be a voice for other people, to be fishers of people so that people can be rescued. And so God, we'll drag our boats up on the shore. We'll drop our nets and we'll leave anything and everything behind to be a part of that. That's what we want, God. That's what we want in your kingdom. And it's in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen. Let's go ahead and stand and respond this morning.